Hypocrisy. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I am your host, Nick Riccata of Riccata Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. And with me today, I'm very happy to have our second guest on uh, <laughs> on direct. Sorry, I had stuff playing in the background. On direct examination, Mr. Phil Labonte. Yes. Labonte. <laughs> it's as Amer it's it's French, but it's as Americanized as you can get. It's Labani. Oh, Labani. Okay. So okay. like Bobby Labani, like the 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 race car driver, Terry Labani. Yeah, That's I never I never knew how to pronounce it, so I've been pronouncing it wrong forever. Like silent <laughs> E at the end, duh. That's uh, <laughs> but but I'm very happy to have you on. Uh, so this is an episode of Direct Examination. It's a new show format that I've been doing for interviews with people who have potentially, I mean, I guess it remains to be seen, interesting stories to tell. And uh, Phil and I met on a episode or on a podcast with uh, Sargon of Akkad a little mm -hmm. while back, and I've been just waiting for a great time to bring him on the show and grill him about his whole life. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you asking. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that. And just... One um, sort of message to the uh, chat here, a couple quick things to the chat. Uh, as this is direct examination, I will not be interacting with the chat for the first portion of the interview for pretty much the whole thing. We're going to have a conversation with us. So if you want to send super chats or whatever, fully appreciated, but I'm not going to address them during the flow of the conversation. That is not what these shows are for. These shows are for getting to know someone's story and having just a nice chat with them. Um, so, Thank you for any of that, but yeah, I, I don't want to mislead anybody here. Second, yes, my lawsuit uh, had an update in it today. I will be talking about it tomorrow in full. My agreements, my disagreements, uh, the stuff that I find very interesting, et cetera, will all be on tomorrow's show. So if you're looking for that information, it's not going to be here. We're talking to Phil tonight. I, I think the lawsuit might be equally as interesting, at least cool. definitely to your to your chat. Now, I don't think so. It's it's really not that interesting of a lawsuit. It's a, an insane person, but we don't have to talk about it today. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I guess I guess we'll just get started. And so I'll start with this super cheesy question because I don't know how to do things on the Internet. Sure. Will you please state your name for the record? Yes, my name is uh, Philip Labonte. Uh, I hail from Massachusetts. I am the lead singer in the heavy metal band All That Remains, and uh, I am fortunate enough to have had a going on 25-year career in the music business, sort of, at least. So that's super awesome and something that I'm very, very grateful for. 25 years in the music business, but you said it's a heavy metal band, so does that even count? Uh, well, I mean... My involvement in the business side is uh, uh, calling it involvement in business is, is a stretch. Um, and considering that we, you know, we predominantly play for, for teenage uh, men or boys. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you could actually call it music either. Um, it, <laughs> it's mostly screaming and blast beats and, you know, so it does it it has musical characteristics there are instruments and we oh. we tend to play in keys so some some metal bands don't play in keys we do really? tend to play in yeah yeah so it, if you don't play in a key that's the way you get your the most dissonant sounding music is is to not play in a key or or do things like harmonize with seconds or or whatever and and that's what a lot of metal bands do just to sound evil and and painful to your ears sometimes i feel like right and that's okay so you're already leading me down this interesting discussion because i was just making a joke based <laughs> on uh an interview i read uh, most of about you or an interview that you gave a while back back in like 2011 oh, you're talking wow. about okay. why you joined the marines mm, which okay we'll get into that i guess the spoiler There's alert there's there very was... little to, to talk about. <laughs> There's very little. Right, right. But spoiler alert, uh, you did join the Marines back in, was it 1993? 1993, yeah. Okay. 
my memory is slightly intact. But uh, one of the things you said was um, part of the reason you joined the military was because you played heavy metal music. So you never thought that that would actually be a sustainable career choice. Yeah. yeah. So I was just making a joke about that. But well, then you brought me to this place where I have a cursory understanding of music and music theory. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned before the show, I really like music. I would love to be able to, to play it and write it and create it, but uh, it's not something I ever practiced as a kid. So I'm like learning it now in my forties, which is not really a great time to start. Uh, but I guess it's better than your fifties or sixties. So, um, so I'm learning it, but I, it never occurred to me that some metal bands play without a distinct key. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you said it produces like a discordant sound. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're looking to sound, you know, dissonant and, you know, evil is, is something that a lot of metal bands look for, you know, um, disharmonic is another way that that some people would describe it. If you're looking to do that, um, either totally disregarding keys will, will kind of get you in that chaotic kind of sound. Um, and also doing, like I said, I like if you're harmonizing seconds, which, which is, you know, you're, you you got one note and then the next note there, one guitar is playing one note and then the ne other guitar would be playing one half step up. So it's just a half step off. Sure. So it's, it's really dissonant sounding and that's the, about the best way you can, you can, uh, you can make dissonant sounding riffs and stuff like that. Are you serious? I can't, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but she is apparently determined to go out. And I took her out right before we got on, too. I'll be no right worries. I'm sorry. I apologize. No worries at all. Well, now that Phil's not here to defend himself, but I think he can still hear me. We're going to talk about how just absolutely atrocious it is that he has life to carry on while he's on a very, very important interview <laughs> with some dummy from the middle of Minnesota. <laughs> oh my goodness that's just how it goes i mean the reason i was late obviously is the reason i'm late most days uh my my kids i had to make sure they were actually getting to bed and going to sleep because there's a difference between children going to bed and actually laying down closing their eyes and going to sleep and they tend to do that right around 11 o'clock so that was i know how this this thing goes i know how this life stuff works out but uh, anyways, in the meantime, um, just a, a note, I was gone from Friday to Monday. I was hoping to uh, do a show on Monday um, yesterday, but I had to get up at 6.30 this morning and I was traveling all day on Monday. So long day of travel combined with having to wake up at 6.30 was not conducive to a show last night. So I apologize for that. Uh, it was not the intention, but uh, right when I got home, I was reminded of my early, early morning in engagement. So that was great. <sighs> but, uh, but anyways, um, I was, uh, I was on a trip with lady rackets. We met up with some friends. It was a good time. Uh, just a little weekend thing. And it was, uh, it was fun. So nothing too crazy, nothing to really talk about. Um, but, uh, but yeah. So my apologies. And yes, I could hear all of it. So Yeah, <laughs> I figured as much. <laughs> all right. And no need to apologize, man. Not at all. Um, okay. So anyway, so this, uh, you said though, that all that remains does not do that. So you're a metal band that plays in key, has kind of traditional harmonies, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I, I grew up like the stuff that I got into when I was a kid was like Iron Maiden and, then on, on into Metallica and then into, into stuff like into death metal. And, and that was really what my, my formative years as a musician, I was playing. Um, and I was really into a lot of the European style bands and a lot of the European bands were playing stuff in E minor and E harmonic minor. And, but they were playing in keys cause they, and they had melodic parts and the riffs were fast and, and aggressive, but they were melodic, which was, a little different than a lot of the heavy bands that were coming from the U S at the time. So there was essentially like the New York death metal sound, which is there's a band called cannibal corpse, which they moved to Florida and it kind of became the Florida death metal sound, but they started out in <laughs> Buffalo. Um, 
in the first couple records. And like they were a little, they were more dissonant and more, some might say more aggressive than the European bands, but that's really kind of listener dependent. But they were definitely more dissonant. They didn't play in keys. Uh, they didn't stay in a key in, for a considerable amount of time. Their their riffs were tended to be a little more technical than the the European stuff. The European stuff was a little more melodic. Um, but those were those were kind of the competing sounds that influenced me when I was starting out. But I definitely fell more on the melodic side. And then as our careers progressed, we went from being just metal and where I was screaming to like, I was started singing and stuff like that too. So. Yeah. And that was, um, okay. So forgive me. Uh, I'm not the most familiar with the actual like trajectory of all that remains. So why sure. don't I ask, when did you guys actually start? Cause they're not the first band that you played with. No, no. I played in a band called Shadows Fall um, from t from 1996 until 1998. Uh, then I started All That Remains in 1998 because I intended to just play guitar. Like that was, I was singing in Shadows Fall and I wanted right. to play guitar in a band is, is, was the deal that I wanted to do. So I started writing riffs for ATR and then a couple months later, uh shadows fall was like yo we want to find someone else so i was like cool i started doing all that remains kind of as my full-time gig and that was in 1990 at the very end of 98 is when all that remains kind of was like getting started i got our, our me and our first bass player dan egan got together and we got our drummer this kid named mike bartlett and, and this guitar player and 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 formed the whole band in 1999 Okay, so the reason I was asking that is because that's around the time I graduated high school in 2000. So it was around the okay. time I was listening to a lot of music. Uh, you know, like when you're that age, you listen to music and it kind of sticks with you for a while. And mm -hmm. I did notice there was like a progression trend from, uh, from, I mean, you can take it back to like 80s hair bands even, where they would start off with this sort of uh, discordant sound. But then with, became really popular for them later on was in the eighties, it became these power ballads, uh, right. That, that had a lot more, I guess, pop feel to them, but mm -hmm. also embrace some of that, some of the more, I guess we can call it metal, uh, mm -hmm. features like, um, they would add, uh, effect to their voice. It'd be a little sure. more gravelly, uh, thinking of Bon Jovi, for example, stuff like that. And they would also have, you know, some heavier guitar in them and, and things uh, than, than traditional pop music or rock music would. And then I noticed that trend kind of continued with the uh, the sort of metal core bands from the late 90s. Um, people that I listened to a lot were like Static X, Rob okay, Zombie. Yeah. Uh, you'd even have uh, like Slipknot and stuff like that. And they all seem to follow that same trend, starting out a little bit more discordant and chaotic and then moving into um, more melodic music later. If, I mean, if I'm right on that, I could be wrong, but that's what it seemed like to me. So was that like a trend of the industry or is that just kind of how bands progress as they play together more and, and kind of become more in tune with each other? I think, well, I mean, there's probably a bunch of different phenomenon going on at the same time. Um, some bands you kind of get over playing the most extreme stuff out there that you can find um and that happened to bands that you know started in the whether it be the 80s or in the early aughts or even bands nowadays there's this band called polyphia that they started out they were a pretty extreme metal band and they didn't have a singer at all but they were a metal band and now if you listen to their stuff they've got they're not a metal band uh by any stretch now but they're right. one of the most interesting bands go going right now and they've got a lot of pop sounding stuff and and their guitar players are super creative um but they're they're you know they're not what you would consider a metal band um and i think that that just comes from playing like if you start out and you're in a really aggressive band a lot of times you'll put a couple really aggressive records out or or whatever and then you're like okay well i did that right and you're kind of like well what else can I do? Or I want to do something else. Some bands get stuck in a position where they 
it's almost like audience capture. I hear YouTubers talk about that a lot. You, you get an audience and, and you produce content that the audience wants to hear. And when you do stuff that the audience doesn't approve of, like they really let you have it. So people start catering to their audience and stuff. Right. And that yeah. makes, you know, and, and that that happens and that happens in the music industry. Everybody knew what the next Slayer record was going to sound like. It was going to sound like fucking Slayer. Right. right? Like everybody did and even like when you like talk to the guys in slayer like they didn't go in to produce or, or to do a record with a producer and then be like you know and have the producer be like so what do you want this record to sound like if if a producer asked the guys in slayer that he's gonna get fired right because everyone knows that a slayer record is coming out you, you know what it's gonna sound like well, um, we want it to sound like prince this time you know so <laughs> And, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, there are bands that put out the same thing because they're, they've got an audience and they're delivering for their audience. And that's cool. We didn't really do that. We took a lot of risks and a lot of chances. So our music changed significantly uh, from one record to the other and, and throughout our career. Sure. And, and that reminds me of a, a band that I completely overlooked that did exactly that uh, and probably much to their benefit. But they're also self-aware of it, which was interesting, which was Sugar Ray. Um, hmm. Sugar Ray started out really heavy and then moved full Did they on really into start pop. really heavy. Yeah, they have some they have some pretty wild like early stuff. Uh, but they really, you know, took trend with the very like sort of beachy Southern California mm -hmm. yeah. sound that they ended up being famous for. But it was it was weird because you could tell when they were like fizzling out even on that, because they're they're one of their last albums that was popular was uh 1459 <laughs> it's like our 15 minutes is up mm -hmm. but uh and then uh mark what what what's that guy's name i don't remember but he went mark on to McGrath. like yeah, yes, mark to McGrath. tv stardom right like he was yeah. doing like game shows and shit yeah he was like i'm done playing music i'm gonna be professionally handsome now yeah exactly i was just <laughs> thinking that i was like he the only reason he did that is because he's pretty right he's got a nice smile and and, and he's good looking you know yeah and he uh it was funny because he won like he won some like sexiest man of the year or whatever and then that's when all good of that him. went to hell uh <laughs> yeah good for him bad for everybody else in sugar ray i guess <laughs> probably but so yeah that is interesting though because there are different ways to do that youtube is definitely like that exactly what you said yeah. you have uh audience capture and you can keep doing the same stuff or you can do what you're kind of interested in i think i think they have advantages both ways but it definitely is chaotic for audiences did you guys mm -hmm. notice uh, a change or a trend in either who your audiences were or uh, oh yeah i guess numbers and stuff like that as you progressed so yeah so we've got stuff that's really really aggressive and fast and heavy and screaming and blah 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 but we also like you mentioned power ballads before one of our biggest songs probably our second most well-known song is a power ballad. like the whole we were like we want to write an 80s style power ballad so it's like paint by numbers you know it's like we went by the the whole the formula that an 80s band would do we were like we right. want to do that because we all grew up listening to that stuff and that was one of the first things that was well not really the one of the first but it, that was a risk you know doing that we also went from being a band that had was almost all screaming to having songs that were singing all the way through and that was a big risk and that was something that a lot of bands didn't survive a lot of bands would try that stuff and in the not especially in the 90s and they wouldn't you know it, it wouldn't hit thankfully for us the first time that we ever tried to do a song that was singing all the way through it was literally the biggest hit we have like it's the only plat it's the platinum record and, and you know the whole nine so it's it was a it turned out great for us but it was a big risk and and there was a lot of arguments and fights about it behind the scenes before we released it and we were like what are we how are we going to do it do we want to have you know we, do we want to put some screams on it or a, a lot of talking um and we also like one another one of our really big songs is a cover of garth brooks uh, the thunder roll so it's like oh yeah we'll, we'll, we'll play shows and like there's some ladies down front that are there to hear <laughs> what if i was nothing and the thunder rolls and I go out there and we play songs that are not those songs. And, you know, kids are crowd surfing and people down front are getting hit in the head. And 
you know, it, it is what it is, but I, that, that kind of stuff, you know, that stuff happens. And, and sometimes it bums people out. There are people that only know about us because of the, you know, the cover of uh, Thunder Rolls. And then when they show up and we open up with like blast beats and me screaming, they're like, <laughs> am I in the wrong place? And this is not the be. country cover band. I thought I was seeing. It's not, it's <laughs> not at all. You noticed. Right. So. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, what I guess though, nowadays, uh, you, I mean, still the lead singer of all that remains. Do you guys still play and tour and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. Or yeah, we, okay. we have, we just did a show. We just played a show, uh, a week ago this past Sunday. Um, that was the only show we're playing this year, but I'm flying to LA on Tuesday to track drums for our upcoming release. We got like five songs that we're doing this trip and it, we are fortunate that we don't have a record label. Um, and we don't have to worry about a record label to put a record out. We can put music out. You know, I, we own a studio and, and actually multiple people in the band own studios. So it's, it's it's not necessary for us to um, to put stuff out the way that a, a standard record label would want to put it out. So we're looking to license some stuff. Uh, maybe we'll go with a record label. Maybe we won't, but we kind of do things at our own pace now. So, which is nice. Now, does that seem to be kind of the way the music industry is turning? Cause like the, the people that I'm listening to, or uh, people, even people I don't listen to, but I encounter, it seems to be a lot more independently driven. And the album model with the way that music streaming kind of works, I guess with the Napster to iTunes sort of funnel that was created, uh, it kind of broke the entire mold of how you release music, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that rec- the music industry is still kind of lagging behind that. Like, so... Like I said, we got a couple companies we're talking about or talking to that are uh, that we're talking about doing a licensing deal with. And one of the companies that we are no longer talking with, uh, like he was trying to throw his weight around. Like if, you know, he wasn't going to be we had to decide if we were going to go with him right then and there, because if 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 we were talking to other people, he was going to take offense to that. And, it, and it's like, <laughs> that's not how the music industry has to be anymore, but that's, that's right. old, old, you know, that's old stuff talking. That's 20 years ago talking nowadays. Artists don't need to do that. Like they don't need to, to sign their, their lives away the way that they used to and stuff. It, it's an option. It might be an easier, uh, an easier, you know, path to a, a regular touring schedule and regular production schedule and stuff. Um, but it's not necessary. People can do amazing sounding things at their own, you know, at their house and stuff. So, and releasing stuff on your own is really, really easy as well. If you can build up an audience enough to, to get things to the point where if you can build up an audience to the point where, you put something out and you get people listening to it that are going to share it with their friends. You can go really, really, really far without a label. Um, if you, if you put up quality music, obviously the quality of the music is going to matter. And there is an intangible that make, you know, that, that is what makes a, a hit a hit, right? Like if you could, bottle how to write hit songs and there are some producers that really have that dialed in but if you could bottle how to write hit songs then everybody would just write hit songs all the time so there's that that x factor that that intangible thing that makes something and a lot of that is is where you know music is at the context that the song comes out and you know the if a song that's a hit now uh was released 15 years ago it might not have been um but you, there's more options for people to do things on their own. You, you don't have to have labels. Uh, they, they can help, though. And I, now, correct me if I'm wrong on this, because it's just an outside perspective. It's you, so you mentioned the like writing a hit song, and there's something about it. A lot, some producers are really good at identifying it or creating it. I guess is is a more apt thing. But it kind of seemed like with the album model, what you would get is one to. Th- maybe three or four songs that they kind of had an eye on that were going to be hits. 
And then they had to fill out content around those hits. Um, is that something that's kind of being done away with or bands being, I mean, I guess more free with the way independent releases of tracks is going, Are they more free to like focus on the songs that they think will be better. Or was that just like an artifact of we're making these songs and then someone's like, Nope, this one's going to be good. This one's going to be good. This one's going to be good for sales. So there's always been, or at least a, as long as I've been in the, in the music business, there was, there are people that like work radio. And so, for a label so the, their job is to take songs that the label's releasing and put them in front of uh program directors at the various radio stations around the country and convince them to play uh play your song um the so they made a hit they yeah and that there you could purchase too there were you could purchase spins and purchase positions pay to play did happen um or and probably still does now you there are other ways that you can like pay to play like if you promise to play their show in town right like and this it's not so much anymore because terrestrial radio isn't really a thing but or it, it's not what it used to be but it, you, it was where if you went to station you know x you didn't go to station y which was one town over that you know shared the the airwaves you would go right. and you would play for that station that station would play you and you would play their festival or their concert or when you went to town you would go to that station and you wouldn't go to the other one the other one would try to get you to play try to you know they would try to play your stuff or they would play some because they would want to be playing the stuff that's hot at you know at at a at whatever their their genre is um but you kind of would commit to a certain amount of a relationship because if, if a station manager is going to put your song into rotation they don't want to just put this one song in they want to know that the next time that you put out a record you're going to have a few songs that they're going to put into it they they want to have you know long-term relationships and and radio stations want to be known or wanted to be known as this is where this band goes like when they come to town we're the ones that are putting on the show um so i'm i'm not so sure if it's that way so much today because right terrestrial radio stations have become such a secondary thought uh you can have a huge hit you don't need that what you want to get is like on a uh tiktok uh trend or something like that to <laughs> get a big yeah. now. And it's weird how like now kind of going along with that tiktok thing social media has the ability to revive or uh or revive an old song Yep. Or completely amplify some song that uh, maybe never had its time in the sun because it'll get attached to some sort of meme and like that cross pollination magic just will make something go crazy. Dude, right now, well, I'm not sure about right this second, but recently, very recently, our biggest song on Spotify was a minute and a half long intro song that only has like one line of singing in it. I yell, I scream something at the end. And it was from a record that came out in 2010. And like, for some reason it got into some kind of algorithm, something and sure. it bumped it up to the number one played thing on Spotify from us. And it's like, we have, you know, we have other songs. We get a decent amount of spins still this, uh, you know, per month on Spotify. And, so for some reason, it got into something. I still have yet to find out where it is that's getting all the spins. But for some reason, this <laughs> rando weird song that it doesn't have it's like, you know, but it, it's got it's getting spins somehow. That is weird. Uh, I wonder. Super weird. But and yeah, the, the strange thing is, depending on what the algorithm serves you, you may never actually find out what mm -hmm. it is that's serving it to someone else. Uh, yeah, that's. God, uh, why the intro song? I don't know. <laughs> why I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's basically, it's just like a mosh riff. It's like, drrr, drrr, you know, just, just heavy kind of, kind of evil sounding thing. But you know, apparently somewhere it's, it's making some kind of TikTok or, or some kind of playlist and, and people are spinning it. I don't care. I mean, I'm, I'm not complaining. I like when people listen to our stuff. Of course. Of course. <laughs> now with that, and uh, sort of bridging into this social media topic. Um, 
two things. You did a recent collaboration with a very large uh, social media creator in making music, but he's not traditionally known as a music creator, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm referring to Tim Pool. Mm -hmm. um, how did that come together? Like, what are your thoughts on this sort of mingling of, um, I guess, uh, the online commentator community with music creation and branching out and stuff like that? So, I mean, I met Tim just because I was on, I'm on Twitter and he's on right. Twitter and, and like there was every once in a while, I'd tweet something and he saw it and he started liking stuff and then he followed me and, you know, I've been a, been a, uh, you know, watching his show for ages and ages. And then he had me on and then there was the Alex Jones episode, which was hilarious, but he calls me up and he's like, Hey, he's like, Alex Jones is coming on. Can you come and help me keep him under control? Because you know how Alex Jones gets and no. how YouTube gets with Alex Jones and blah, blah, blah. And I'm Perfectly like, fine with him. <laughs> I'm like, I got this. I got this. No problem, Tim. I got this. Right. We get there and I'm like, hey, you know, meeting everybody and, and everything's all fine. As soon as we start going and Alex starts talking like something crazy i'm like yes yes this is why i'm here <laughs> like just agging him on go yes tell me about this like just doing everything i can to get alex to, to go <laughs> and it, it, so you did it, the uh, exact opposite of what you're supposed to do <laughs> but yes yes um and it was tons of fun and and it was a, a well-received episode and so that you know kind of solidified me and Tim's relationship as kind of buddies. And, and he was like, Hey, why don't you come and check out what we're doing uh, musically? And, and he's like, you know, come on down. And, and basically I consult with the, with them for the music side and, and give them my opinion and, and do stuff like that. And I also do the IRL podcast once in a while and I do the pop culture crisis uh, podcast once in a while. So I still do ATR, you know, there's, there's no like issue with, with, uh, with touring or playing shows or right. writing and stuff. So, you know, I was like, all right, it's cool. It's fun. You know, I, I genuinely do believe in what Tim says he's trying to do. Like, he's like, I want to create culture um, I want to create stuff that people are interested in beyond just politics. The right needs to be able to create art that people may or may not find compelling, but at least that has a platform that isn't controlled by essentially the left, which is what most of your, <laughs> you know, most of no. your... <laughs> that's I mean, not yeah. true I've, I've been told by vice and rolling stone that that's not a thing that exists you know, the, 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 so you <laughs> so you see the dilemma that we're in and so i'm like yeah i i support this because like back in the day like in like 2011 or 2012 like i was talking mad sm smack about tom morello for being a communist right like sure and people were giving me giving me grief like oh you know how do you know he's a communist and da, da, da. i'm like well he's enraging his machine so there's, <laughs> there's that yeah you know? i mean the only reason they were against the machine at the time is because the machine was capitalism exactly and still somehow in that far distant past of 2011 we still had some semblance of capitalism and yeah. uh, and not a centrally planned economy but that's been whittled away that's what i'm <laughs> saying so like dude in 2006 we the the record that put us on the map right it's this record called the fall of ideals the fall of ideals i was talking about like all of this shit that made america like the idea because the thing that I was noticing and I, I mention this a lot nowadays, but I was noticing all of the stuff we're seeing really causing societal problems back then. Like and the point of calling it the fall of ideals was to be like, hey, these I these things that that are society are, is built on these things are important things like integrity 
like like being self-sufficient, standing up for yourself, knowing that hard work is how you achieve things. These are the things that at the time they weren't like they weren't looked at as like they are now. Now there's total, total uh, just Animo like animosity antagonism to these kind of ideas but back in like 2005 it just seemed like people were like yeah well, they're quaint ideas yeah you know it is important to have integrity but you do got to get <laughs> yours you know and so right. maybe lying is okay because you know every the other guy's gonna lie and it was like these things that i you know was taught are important when i was a kid they had become quaint and i was like this is really bad for like society if you don't think things like integrity and honesty and and stuff like that if you don't think those those things are impo important that's going to translate into your society and now you know fucking 20 years later almost or 15 years later i'm like i fucking told you so <laughs> right you know and i caught a shit ton of hell for being like the only guy in the metal world or well, yeah, the metal world that that really was like standing up saying, hey, like there are changes going on in, in our society that aren't good and that are going to cause a lot of strife and problems. And we're kind of seeing that, you know, materialize nowadays. Yeah. And <clears throat> around that same time, I'm trying to think of exactly when I used to listen to a lot more talk radio. I was driving a lot. So I would listen to Rush. I would listen to Glenn Beck. Uh, when everything was going south in my life, I would be stuck with Sean Hannity or whatever. Hold on. Glenn Beck. <laughs> there's times, there are times when I would listen to some of his stuff back in the day and I'd be like, man, maybe he's a little out there. Man, I take all that shit back. Glenn Beck was, he, he, he was smelling something too. He may not get at, like all the details right, but he was on to some, some stuff. Right. And, and what I was going to talk about specifically that I remember so much of him saying resonated with what you just said, which he was talking about um, sort of this the difference in ideas between capitalism as just sort of a an abstract idea. Capitalism is the thing where, it you know, the Webster's dictionary definition, but this sort of capitalistic system is derived from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. But Beck would always talk about his other book that no one read, which was Moral Sentiments. And the, the idea was that you can't have a capitalistic system without some sort of moral integrity for the populace. Because yeah. if you have free reign to kind of do what you want, but you don't have an idea that people need morality to exist, then you you end up with the sort of evil robber baron uh systems that we've seen manifest from time to time in America and ever, anywhere else. I mean, that that's the whole sure. issue with capitalism is that it does allow people to take what they, whatever they can. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't have a moral populace, then they, one will do that. They'll take from others. But the other thing they'll do is not be able to identify when a company or a person is acting in an immoral way because they don't have any sort of moral character themselves. Yeah. So, I, I, I think you're, I think that's, I mean, I think that's, that's obviously right. Um, and as much as, so, I mean, I'm, I do find Nietzsche's description of reality compelling, right? Like, they're like everything is competing forces and you know only the strong survive and stuff um and there is no morality other than what we make because there's no god and like i'm i'm not a i'm i'm a, an agnostic kind of person so i find those arguments compelling but at the same time I don't think that people understood what Nietzsche was saying when he said that, that, you know, when he s declared that God is dead, if they think, and this might be something that's representative of, of more like not so much the attitude today, but when they think that like God is dead is a good thing like that, that was not what he was saying. And it's because without that moral compass, without that, 
what essentially most of the Abra the, the Abrahamic religions kind of get most stuff generally right to make society work. Not talking about the dogma or or any talk of Pegasus or anything like that, but like the the general stuff of like, look, be good to your neighbor because they're your neighbor. Don't steal, right. you know, don't kill, don't lie. These kind of things, they're how you can have a society that works. And if you lose those things because they, because you don't no longer believe in God, you say, well, those things are quaint. They're associated with God. So you don't really need them or they become optional. I think you get that moral decay in your society from, from the, the lack of, of virtue that comes from having, you know, a, a godless society. And again, this is coming from someone that's an agnostic, but I think that God, that God as an idea is something that makes civilized society possible. Otherwise, I think your society kind of breaks down. Okay. So let's, this is really interesting to me. So you're an agnostic, uh, I saw on Wikipedia, atheist. I don't know if they like you used to be an atheist and now you're more agnostic. Or I'm that agnostic was a... because atheism is a belief, right? And and so there and there's a lot of things that go along with atheism, and it turns into a lot of atheists are anti-Christian, and I'm not at all anti-Christian sure. or anti-religious. Um, I just don't believe that I can know about anything that happens outside of reality, and everything that comes from religion is stuff that happens outside of reality right like god is supernatural he's outside of nature and, and the right. only thing he has I can to ever... be to create it exactly. yeah exactly like and and so like uh, the only thing i can know about is things inside the 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 universe that i exist in so because i can't know i'm just an agnostic but i don't have any kind like like i said atheist tends to come with a lot of antagonism towards religion that I don't have. So I don't want to call myself an atheist. So. Yeah, it makes sense. <clears throat> and and uh, I think most Christians who have ever encountered an atheist <laughs> should certainly identify with that because it, it's, it's not about their non-belief. It, it's like they have to proselytize yeah. the non-belief with it, which was such a confusing thing to me. I'm like, why do you have to convince people to atheism? Why do you care if there is no... If there is no God, then it doesn't matter that they believe in something that doesn't exist. Yeah. I and guess it, it, if I had my choice, I would prefer to believe. Like if I if I could if I had my choice, I would rather there be a God and sure. I would rather to live a holy life and then live forever in eternity afterwards. That is the better option than the one that I actually believe, you know. So, yeah, the terrifying uh, idea that when you stop, it's over. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, so lights out, lights out, you know, so. Right. That is. <clears throat> so right I don't have any, I don't, I don't, I don't have any kind of negative feelings towards religion because religion, to me, that's like, that's what I wish I had. I, I'm kind of more envious of people that actually believe, you know, because sure. I just don't, I don't feel like I have that belief in me, but it's not anything that I can control. So I think that people that are atheists, Oftentimes they used to believe or wanted to believe. And then like when they read, when they finally came to terms with the fact that they didn't believe, they blame the religion and they're mad. Sure. Like they, they had, well, maybe they didn't even have it, but they, they either perceived or manifested some trauma or maybe they did have a trauma, you know, it could, and it, I don't mean like something crazy, like they were molested or whatever. That could be true for some people, but just uh, one of the things I used to remember hearing was, well, all Christians are fake, for example, because the people that they encountered had this sort of facade that they would put on around religious events and then they'd act completely differently everywhere else. And, and by differently, I don't mean like, I don't mean like they didn't follow the tenets of the religion in perceptible ways other than they became complete jackasses so they would act very loving or whatever but then you know if uh, to other people uh, and i saw this a lot in high school um they would they would just be they'd be the popular kids who were rude to other people they'd have a very haughty demeanor to them and and that turned a lot of people that i uh knew off of off of religion you know people i grew Hypocrisy up with is ugly right yeah 
Yeah. yeah, especially when it hits you specifically, and you're like, wait, that doesn't, that's not fair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this doesn't yeah. seem like it's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. But I do, I do find it interesting though that you seem to adhere to the idea that the concept of a moral anchor that is this thing that says this is good and this is bad is necessary for a functioning mm-hmm. society. Did I mischaracterize that? No, I think you're I think I I think that's pretty close to it. I do think that even if you don't deep down believe that there is an afterlife and in a loving personal god that you can have a personal relationship with, it's hard to deny that societies that have excuse me, societies that have, you know, religion tend to function pretty well. There might be oppressive aspects of the society. Um but they work and it seems like because we don't have a lot of history to go by, but it seems like they last longer than atheist societies. You know, right, like well, the that's... Soviet Union was like 70 years. The Nazis petered out after like 20 or something like that. You know, it, it, and also the atrocities and the horrors are greatly overstated when it comes to most religions, the atrocities committed by the Nazis and the communists, those are not overstated. And I don't care what Nick Fuentes says. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, we're not going to talk about wooden doors and teeth on this show, Phil. (laughs) I, for one, love the brothers and sisters of Israel. No, uh, no, so it's, but no, that's a, that's a very interesting point. And it, it is a thing that needs to be addressed. And for some reason, I mean, motivated interest or whatever, you do have this sort of apologetic for uh, socialist and communist systems that have produced intense amounts of suffering uh, and death, either as a byproduct of the system in the cases of, you know, mass starvation and stuff like that, uh, and uh, like hyperinflation because they have the centrally planned economy that doesn't account for actual economics. (laughs) <laughs> so you have those, but you also have direct atrocity because yeah. part of the system of socialism or communism is the requirement that everyone buy into it. Yep. And dissident voices, you say, actually, you don't have to do like you don't have to be forced to work for the same wage as everybody else doing this one thing that you may not want to do. But you don't have to do that. There are other ways to run a society where like you get to choose whatever you do. You can make yourself economically mobile. Like you can grow something. Yep. Uh, you can leave stuff for your kids. And then that, that can't be allowed. Like you have to shut that down immediately. And so we see both like the byproduct causing massive amounts of death in the Holodomor throughout China, um, you know, the Soviet union. And then you, you also have that sort of direct, we need to control the narrative Yep. message that we see with nazi germany uh cambodia you know stuff like that mm-hmm. and um i do find it interesting that that's kind of tied to this sort of atheistic approach do you think that that has to do with kind of i mean the christian gods i i guess one of the tenets of the christian god is deliverance from mortal oppression right no matter the circumstance mm-hmm. that was it's kind of, you get that throughout the story of the Jews and then into modern Christianity that you're sometimes going to live in a place that sucks for you, but you have hope because you have this other thing. You have this moral compass. You have a promise of salvation and an mm-hmm. afterlife that's going to be better. And, but with the atheistic societies, government needs to be God. Do you think that that's kind of where that comes from? Um. So... I think that things like social, like socialism and, and the things that spawn from there, I don't think they're as atheist as they, they, they say they're, they behave like a religion. And so I don't, I don't think that they're, they're as atheist as they say I've been, now I'm not super schooled in philosophy or anything, but like me either. So we're in the same boat. 
cool. So then, <laughs> you, so then I can, all I got to do is sound like a, all I got to do is sound confident, and then I can make it through the rest of the podcast. And then like the chat can go ahead and check me and be like, ah, he was full of shit, but we we won't know about it till after. That's but, how uh, I've led my live my entire life. So smart, smart. <laughs> just, I like it. I'll just speak like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Usually don't. <laughs> so James, you know who James Lindsay is? Uh, is he the? He's a guy. He's a current guy. Um, yep. He does stuff with schools, right? Yeah. Well, he yes, he started. He and his buddy buddies got together, and they noticed that like the humanities departments were just putting out bullshit. And he's like, I really think that we could game this system and get bullshit papers oh yeah approved of in like real <laughs> journals so they wrote like him peter bogosian and helen pluckrose wrote a boatload of papers like they got like seven papers into actual journals and so like that means that they get that means they're quote unquote actual knowledge. Like that means right, that yeah. they're their knowledge. If they get put into the journals, that is no longer theory or anything. That's not hypothesis. That is knowledge. It's peer reviewed. The, it's peer reviewed. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. One of them was a rewrite of Mein Kampf. Oh God. <laughs> I swear. And it was, but instead of being about Jews, it was, it was from a feminist perspective. They rewrote a portion of Mein Kampf and they, and the, the feminist journal accepted it. Um, what was another one? Another one they went to, they said they went and spent 10,000 hours at a dog park watching the way that dogs behave in an effort to figure, to understand men. And they came up with the conclusion that they should, that, that feminists should train men the way that we train dogs. And that paper <laughs> got, got, they got a message back saying that, that it was an important a contribution to knowledge of they, course because like, it was you can't oh, go bullshit. Ahead. well you can't the thing is it's ten thousand hours think of how long that is <laughs> like sitting in a dog park watching dogs fuck come on it's the uh well i mean that's the mastery time right from uh Apparently. gladwell's book about the 10 well i think gladwell talks about it but yeah this ten thousand yeah, hour rule the mess. right the master, the master watching dogs having sex is a, quite a feat Eat. But <laughs> so, my favorite thing is thinking of how big and stereotypical the peers who reviewed that must have looked, right? Like right. they got that and they're like, oh yeah, men are dogs. They're garbage. Yeah. And they're just uh, loving every second of it. And <laughs> so he that's that's some of his background, but he noticed some shit was going on in academia. And he noticed probably I'm not sure exactly when he did, but it was Essentially, what he's figured out and him and his friends figured out is there's a whole like the entire humanities departments like and this isn't just in one class, one school. This is like this is nationwide humanities right. departments across the country are all corrupted and they're not producing knowledge. They're not producing anything of value at all. And this kind of stuff is starting to filter out into reality into the big broader world people used to say look let these kids study their crazy stuff in college and then when they get out into the real world they'll learn but what happens yeah. was they went straight from the colleges straight into the hr departments so yeah. then so Go then ahead. they get two people in there and one person makes a makes an accusation against one of the normies and it's like oh you did this that scares the shit out of the company because, oh, who's this guy? Like, we've got this problem with sexism because their HR, the person in charge of HR went through the humanities departments. The, per the person that made the accusation went through those humanity departments. So they're bo they both understand what they're doing and they intentionally are changing the culture of the business. All it takes is one lawsuit and the whole company is going to go ahead and change. They're going to have that's why you've got so many companies that are terrified of their employees with lawsuits and, and HR departments are, are booming and stuff. Yeah, well, because you, you have that. And then when that lawsuit happens, you have the same people who didn't go into HR went into journalism mm -hmm. and they they have this they have this beautiful thing that journalists do, especially today. With the advent of sort of online journalism, which I 
don't get me wrong. I love online journalism. I love the fact that guys like Tim Pool, uh, Jeremy Hambly, me to some extent get to have a platform to speak our minds on whatever subject. And if people want to listen, great. Like they have the opportunity to do that. I think that's a nice break from having just these, you know, couple of network televisions talking about news. But part of the, the other side of that is that you have these online rags that will cite each other. They, they do this insider move where it's like one will publish something, the other will cite it. And then another one will publish uh, a third paper or a third article or whatever and cite the second one yep. as a source. And they then you have to like start tracing it back, like a connect the dots to find out who lied first. Yeah. And it's, and it's this, all bullshit. Right. And it's the same group of people or the same sort of mindset of people that were in the humanities departments because you're finding it throughout, uh, you know, humanities and the arts. And eventually journalism is writing. It's in the writing department of these schools and yeah. uh, and you get the same people and the same mindsets running through it. They all, they're all trained under the same 1960s communists that were in the United States who just filtered into the education system. Mark Hughes, Foucault, uh, Derrida, um, Horkheimer, you know, those are all the, the, the big stars of the left uh, philosophy, left, philosophically from the 50s and 60s and all of their influences all over uh modern and mo modern schools both in your college level but also in your curriculum um that's being taught to young people like grade school there right. there is an effort this this guy paulo freire is this brazilian guy um, he wrote a book called uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and it goes into teaching. Ch it goes into how to teach children and use normal lessons to get them to ask political questions. So sure. you teach. So you teach them about. Um, one of the things that he would use was favelas, right? So the slums of, of Brazil. And he would teach about favelas. But when you teach, when you, you if he would use uh, favela as, a, as a, a vocabulary word. And so that way you can, you use that, but you get the vocabulary part of it. But then you also go ahead and tell them what a favela is and why there are favelas and why with the difference between favelas and the regular suburbs and, and, if you're a kid that lives in, in the slums, in the favelas, they're like, well, why do I live in these? And why do some other people live in nice places? And kids don't notice that they're poor until someone else tells them. Right. For the most part, right? Unless you're, unless you're starving poverty, kids don't notice that they're poorer than other kids unless someone points it out. So what he what his teaching method does is it gets kids to ask political questions and you can apply this across the board for almost any subject and that's one of the 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 main issues that's going on in in schools today um is the politiz politicization of the curriculum and that's why you see that that's what's going on with the lgbt issues that you see like the whole trans stuff that's being uh, pushed in schools and stuff like that it, the point is to get kids to ask questions about it. So that way they, they ask political questions. So that way you can make activists out of them. I don't know what you're talking about. I, for one, <laughs> fully love and respect our gender changing masters. <laughs> <laughs> no, know, it, trans transformers were something totally different when I went and I saw the movie. Oh yeah. Me too. <laughs> Grew up with transformers. The cartoon loved it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Right. Right, especially when Optimus Prime went from semi truck to like yep. family sedan. That was perfect. He became a <laughs> Honda Civic. He's like, I'm tired of identifying as something big and diesel powered. Uh, <laughs> the best thing no, but, about the Transformers was the Transformers was Michael Bay uh, hiring uh, what's her name, Megan Fox. Megan Fox, yeah. God, that movie was so good because of her. <laughs> no, <laughs> what are you talking she's, about? It was the big so robots good. that were cool. Not no, her like gonna... bending over the open hood of the car. Have you ever seen her weird thumbs? I have. They're except weird. The first thing I asked when people brought it up was she has thumbs. <laughs> I wasn't aware of this. I didn't but know. Yeah, then them. it was brought to my attention. And I said, that's yeah, fine. I, 
I could deal with it. That's I can definitely it. deal with it. But uh, no, this, so that's a really interesting thing. Um, and something I've talked about a lot is this idea of creating a lexicon, um, one to gatekeep whatever discussion you want. And we, we yep. saw this, I saw this most with sort of the LGBTQ stuff coming up through the early 2000s where suddenly people are using terms like cisgendered and, and we're all like, what the hell is that? Like, there's just a, a person you, that's there. Like, how come you can't just say normal? Ooh, that's very offensive. How dare you? <laughs> I how, know. How dare you suggest that a, like an extreme minority population would be something other than normal? Because somehow being abnormal became offensive, which abnormal is just a statement that it is not the normative behavior. It doesn't matter. Like it's not a moral judgment or a, like a criticism. It just is. Yeah. Right. Am I crazy yeah. on that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I know I'm abnormal because my favorite snack is something uh, my wife and I invented, which is to take two Ritz crackers and put them on opposite ends of a Reese's peanut butter cup. If you've never okay. done this, you should try it. And I, you know, it I, I, I would not do it in milk. I would not criticize that because that I'm, I back the salty sweet mix. And yeah. that's what it sounds like it's, it's got a lot of that. That salty sweet mix. I, I would try that. But most people have never tried that. So nope. that would be, I'm in the minority there. I'm abnormal. That's okay. Because I'm special. My mom told me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it, it is really interesting, though, you brought up this idea of creating political conversations in the classroom. And we're seeing after COVID, parents are finally being exposed to this. Yeah. And you brought up this really interesting point that I didn't, I hadn't thought of, but it's so true, uh, especially for children. You know, we, we judge our own lives relative to what else there is. And if you grow up in the slums of like a poor city, then you don't think you're different. Like that's just mm -hmm. how people live in your experience. And uh, that's how they live in your experience when you're a concrete thinker, but children eventually will progress into this non-concrete abstract thinking as they develop. But if you can cement early on in that concrete thing, these ideas that there's disparity and that disparity is automatically bad and unfair, then you can, like, like I said, you can cement this, this concept in them that their life is bad because of someone else automatically and that there's some magical fix that will bring it all together and it has nothing to do with their own like ability to you know, work hard or, yep. or innovate like that. You can, that becomes foreign. You can stunt a whole population's ability to better themselves just by telling the children, you know, that they're, they, they can't do anything or they're not going to be able to get it or to, or blame other people. Like to, nowadays it's, it's pretty popular to, with the whole uh, white guilt stuff going on. It's pretty popular to, to convince people that it's white people's fault that things have happened and, and, Etc. And you do that when they're young and you will make racists. And that's of not course. something that we want to, that we should be trying to do. You, we, it, we were told this was bad. Yes. The racism thing is not good. Yeah. But then, would, of course, yeah, the creation of racial animosity. But it's like, well, it's towards the racists. So then it's okay. Yeah. That's essentially that's the argument. But I mean, uh, that's what they you know, obviously they would say. But obviously, we both know that not everybody that is not a leftist is not a rate. You know, it's not not everybody that's not a leftist is a racist. You know what I mean? It's like there's plenty of people. <laughs> well, I would say the vast majority of people that are not leftists are also not racist. And there's an argument to be made that the most racist people in Western society are leftists that are focused on race all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, made. it seems to be obvious to me that that's true uh, because they spend their entire life focusing on race as the, uh, you know, the sort of predicate issue. Mm -hmm. But then it's also the solution is always race-based as well. It's like, well, we have to take this group that's just not good enough and lift them up because they've mm -hmm. been oppressed. It's like, but if the oppression has stopped, then you shouldn't need like, I don't know, that, maybe I'm insane to think that people can and will like they will achieve if you let them. But uh, 
But the weird thing is it seems to be used as a tool to keep people down under the guise of helping them out. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree, but I think that, I think that it's, it's mostly it's, it, it is used to keep people down or give them, give them a reason to believe uh, that they have been kept down. I think that the race stuff is just more about sowing discord than anything else though. I really do think that okay. people that are trying to people that promote those types of ideas, I their their intent is to make is to agitate like it's it's agit prop. You, you know, the, the idea there was this streamer and I don't remember his name, um, but it, he was doing a, a space with nuance, bro. And the kid said that he believed like 30 percent of the black people in the u.s get shot by police every year wow <laughs> and and they gave him a chance to walk it back and it's like you realize you'll run out of black people if you shoot shoot 30 percent of them every year and and it's it, so it, i mean that's totally ridiculous i but thought it was there i thought it was 60 percent of them got shot <laughs> you know i i i <laughs> I, I I'm not sure what what jokes we should make here, but anyways. Um. Oh, whatever jokes you want, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> okay, well, we're on YouTube, aren't we? Though, not for long. Okay, we're actually, I was I was waiting for a good segue. Maybe this is a good segue. There you go. Uh, first, we have to talk about something that is not communistic. Uh, very important, and that is the sponsor of the show today, which is Field of Greens. Fieldofgreens.com promo code knows. Is, uh, is how you guys can get some fruits and vegetables into your diet if you don't like actually keeping them around, cooking them, and eating them. Uh, it's really simple. Of course, as you know, you get this, this thing like with water in it. Or you can put whatever. I mean, you could put liquor in it, uh, I guess. It might get kind of hard to drink because it's a lot. But uh, you can do juices and stuff like that as well. You can mix it into anything. Um, you grab a scoop. You put it in. You close it up and shake it up. And then you drink it. One serving of fruit, one serving of vegetables per 10 gram scoop of powder. And uh, and that's it. I mean, it's that simple, guys. Look, this isn't like uh, some vitamin infused thing. It's literally just ground up fruit and vegetables uh, to get sort of that healthy balance of having those in. If you're like a proper human who likes to just eat meat because meat is more fun to you digest. You probably mix that stuff in vodka. You can. I have. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. But don't tell him I said this. It was the, the guy from the company actually suggested that. He's like, well, I just mixed mine some vodka. And I was like, even better. <laughs> but don't tell anyone. So I'm <laughs> glad this anyone. is a private conversation. What are you talking about? Really That's nice. like one of the major selling points. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can mix it. I mean, you can mix it in anything. Whatever you drink, whatever you like. It's just a real convenient way to get it. And it tastes pretty good, too. Uh, most of them. The lemon lime, I didn't like at first, but now after drinking a bunch of it, it's it's pretty good. So anyways, big thank you to fieldofgreens.com, promo code knows for uh, sponsoring the show. And the field of greens does not mean what we all want, which is to put the green party in a field, oh. call it the Holodomor, and deprive them of potatoes. It's so mean. <laughs> potatoes are so good depriving people of potatoes is just un, un, cruel and unusual punishment I'm willing to suspend the 8th amendment for the green party <laughs> with that guys uh, we are actually going to end on YouTube and transition uh, bravely over to Rumble um, where we will be free to uh, carry on this conversation if you are on YouTube and you want to follow us over on Rumble it's pinned in the top of the chat. It's also in the description on YouTube, uh, and it will be over there. I'm going to play a little 20-second sort of stinger, and then we'll be off of YouTube entirely. So uh, please come join us. If you aren't going to join us for the rest of the show, we'll catch you next time tomorrow at 11 p.m. Central on YouTube and Rumble as well. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll see you guys in just a couple minutes, or a couple minutes, in 20 seconds. Peace. Peace. For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, good.